we have now entered the section of Genesis where the picture focuses in on one individual and his family line. Remember I said there's different, you know, the different focuses, wide view, you know, the, the great flood, and the create, that's the wide view, and then focuses in on one individual sometimes, one or two individuals. So this is an instance where the Bible is doing that. So far uh, in our study, the Bible has given us the origins of several things, but one in particular, the natural world and how it has become what it is. So we've, we've read about the creation and we've read about you know, what took place back there that has brought us to the point where we're at today with, the, uh, you know, with the, the environment, the way it is, and the weather, and so on and so forth. Like we've mentioned before, climate change started at the flood and continues on to this day. And then we've learned about the social conditions. You know, how did the different you know, cultures evolve, different languages, and so on and so forth. And we've traced that back, or the Bible does, to the Tower of Babel. So um, we've had these, uh, these kind of wide views, you know, big, big picture um, uh, episodes that we've talked about. Um, we've seen that the environment has not changed other than to continue its rate of degeneration. And the social situation has not changed either. Uh, we still read in the paper the same kinds of problems caused by sin that plagued man even thousands of years ago. You know, Cain was jealous of Abel and resented him and so on and so forth and he was angry and let that thing boil up to the point where you know, he killed his brother. Is there anything new under the sun? I mean, people, how many people today get killed? Because, you know, we read about it all the time. Some guy gets a gun, walks in, shoots a whole bunch of people in his own family because he's mad at one person. So there's, there's nothing new there. The Bible simply demonstrates the root of all of these uh, phenomenon that we, we observe ourselves in our life. So the difference in the Bible perspective now, now that we enter chapter 13, is that it will no longer focus on the causes of man's predicament. It will now focus on the cure. So the first 12 chapters of Genesis tell us why we are in the fix that we are in. Personally, emotionally, you know, uh, morally, and also physically, environmentally. How did we get to where we are? Well, it's already explained that in the first 12 chapters. Now we're going to now we're going to develop the cure. God's plan to send a savior will now be traced beginning with a man and his family from whom God will then build a nation and then through whom that nation a savior will come. I've mentioned before that you know, God is to appear in the world, right, as a man. Uh, the question is, what kind of man is he going to be? What nation is he going to come from? Is he going to be one of the nations? Which language will he speak? And so on and so forth. You know, what customs will he have? So instead of selecting an existing nation through whom he would make his appearance on the world stage, what God does is he creates a nation. He creates a culture. He takes one man from Ur and he says to that man, from you, I'm going to create a culture, a nation, a history, a language, a people, a religion, laws, a history, customs, you know, everything will be created from this one man. And the objective of this will simply be to provide a historical stage upon which the Son of God can make His appearance. If we remember that, if we remember that that's what's going on here, then we're able to kind of fit all the pieces of the puzzle together in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is simply the story of the creation of that nation and how through that nation God preserved it through the centuries so that His Son could appear on a historical stage. All right, so last week we introduced this man, this individual, and we followed his first steps of faith. His name is Abram, and then later it was changed to Abraham. So we, we kind of go back and forth calling him the name, but 
Last time we saw his call uh, to leave his homeland and go to a land, to go to the land of Canaan. God is going to make something new out of this man. And so what does he do to shake off his own customs and his own religion? He puts him in a place you know, where he doesn't know anything. He doesn't know the customs and so on and so forth. He isolates him. Okay? That happens to us too sometimes. You, know, you wonder, you, know, you feel out of sorts, you, 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 know, you feel like you're in the desert or you're dry spiritually and you wonder what, what's happening. And a lot of times what's happening is that God is isolating you. He's kind of working on you. It's as if you know that yellow ribbon that goes when they're working on a road there and they put up the yellow ribbon. You know? It's like when God takes a yellow ribbon and He puts a yellow ribbon about, uh, about us, you know, and it's like uh, God is at work here. He's doing something with us. And a lot of times we, we're trying to break through that yellow ribbon and get back on the old road. And He said, no, I'm not, I'm not finished yet. You know, you, I'm doing something with you. Stop. You know, you know your babies, you know, your little babies, you know, and you're saying, would you stop moving so I can get your pants on and get you dressed and ready to go and they're moving around. Well, we're like that with God. We're, we're trying to run ahead or we're trying to fix the problem or we're trying to give Him the answer. You know? And He's saying, would you just kind of hold still for a minute? Just let me do what I need to be doing here. All right. Same thing with Abraham. Then his test of faith in Egypt where he actually failed to rely on God for help and protection. You know, God calls him, tells him to be faithful. Oh yeah, sure, I'll be faithful. You know, and then the first time something happens, boom, he relies on himself. He goes to Egypt to get food because you know, there's a, a famine and he gets himself into trouble. Right? He lies about his wife and the Pharaoh. He gets crossways with the king, so on and so forth. And then of course God rescues him anyways in order to not just to protect Abraham but to protect the seed, right? Because the seed is going to come through him. So today we're going to continue with Abram's journey and his relationship this time. We're going to focus, you know, last time focused, close focus on Abram and the king. Now it's Abram and his nephew Lot that's traveling with him. So let's go to chapter 13 and we'll read verses one to four. So it says, so Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev and he and his wife and all that belonged to him and Lot with him. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. He went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So he leaves Egypt right after the fiasco with the king, and he goes back to the land of Canaan. You notice he goes back more wealthy than he went in. <laughs> He's a rich man. He still has his wife. She has not been violated by the king. He still has his family, his nephew Lot and their people. But now he's a wealthy, he's a wealthy individual. The problem is that he has wealth, but he doesn't have a clear conscience. That's his problem. You know, Jesus said, what will you give in exchange for your soul? Well, Abram had sort of exchanged security for his soul. In other words, he felt secure in Egypt, but that was based on a lie. Notice that upon leaving Egypt, that he goes straight back to the first place that he had settled when he originally came to Canaan, and he went back to the original altar where he first called upon God's name. Notice that when he went to Egypt, he didn't build any altar there, did he? No altar was being built in Egypt. No prayer was being made in Egypt. He took responsibility for his care upon himself. But now when he goes back, he goes back to the altar and he calls on God's name in order to renew the relationship that he had with God and to ask for forgiveness. So let's go to his decision, continue reading, verses five, six, and seven. It says, now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, and the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. 
and there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling then in the land. Interesting little factoid at the end there that the writer throws in, you know, that the Canaanite and the Perizzite were living you know, where they were. So the fact that they were rich was not a blessing to them because uh, of their dispute. Their wealth was a burden. Perhaps Lot lost respect because of what happened, because Lot is watching Abram, you know, who has traveled away from home based on a promise from God. Now he's watching Abram, how Abram is acting, the lie that he has perpetrated here. Perhaps Lot has lost respect. Perhaps their wealth weighted them down so much that it motivated them to settle somewhere other than remaining mobile, because God wanted them to remain mobile. Perhaps materialism breeded competition and self-interest. Well, that couldn't be, could it? Money couldn't, certainly couldn't cause any problems, right? Has money ever caused problems in your family? You don't think money causes problems? Wait till the reading of the will. <laughs> then you're going to find out if money causes problems in a family. So the Bible says that eventually they couldn't dwell together peacefully because there was competition, and the competition was for resources. Animals eat food, food from the land. So the competition caused strife between their servants and also produced a, a bad witness before the people of the land. Notice now why the writer puts in the Perizzites and the Canaanites were there. They're observing these people from somewhere else who are wealthy people, obviously, quote, blessed by their gods, and they're observing how these people are acting with one another. Now, Abram has learned a lesson about making a proper witness before non-believers. He's learned his lesson in Egypt, and so he offers to solve the conflict. So let's see how he offers to solve this conflict. So Abram said to Lot, please, let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If not to the left, then I will go to the right. Or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley, and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly, and sinners against the Lord. So notice what Abram does. He gently appeals to him based on the fact that they are brethren and there shouldn't be any strife between them. It's a good start, isn't it? Note the way that Abram solves the problem. Very interesting. First of all, he describes the problem. He does not assign blame. So many times in relationships, any kind, friendships, marriages, brothers and sisters, you know, friends, workers, whatever, Every time that there's a, a problem of some kind that might cause friction, many times what happens is one of the individuals will point to the other person as the cause of the problem or as the problem. And you know that you're starting off on the, right, on the wrong foot there, right? Because <laughs> if the discussion to solve the problem begins with, the problem with you, <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting anywhere with that discussion. So notice that Ab uh, Abram here does not to try to uh, lay blame. The, he just describes the problem. The problem was that they were brethren and there was strife between them and that wasn't the right thing. Well, you know, if somebody said that to me, I wouldn't be offended. You know, if someone says, we, we're brothers, we love each other, but we're not seeming to communicate here or get along. Well, you know, I don't feel guilty all of a sudden. I, you know, the only answer I can give can be perhaps, 
Yes, I've noticed that too. Or perhaps, well, really, I, I hadn't noticed that. And then next, he proposes a solution that will solve the problem, not one that will aggravate the problem. Not, he doesn't throw gasoline on the fire. So he didn't throw his weight around, although he could have, he was the older one. He didn't gossip about, he didn't go to his servants and say, you know that lot, he's starting to be a troublemaker, that guy. I mean, I rue the day that I brought that guy with me for, you know what I'm saying? He didn't scheme, he didn't promote more quarreling. He did what was necessary to stop the fighting. And a lot of times in, a, in, a, in an argument, although you're, you're wondering, man, what does this have to do with personal relationships? But it has a lot to do with it. A lot of times in a conflict between people, the objective that the individuals have is to win the fight rather than win the peace. When your objective is to prove that you're right or prove that you're the injured party or prove anything like that, it's going to be pretty tough. The objective, the first objective should always be to win the peace, to find peace somehow because you can't resolve conflicts if there's no peace. You just make it worse, it just keeps, I've, I've done counseling with people who have said, we've been married 27 years and we've had the same argument for 27 years. You know, we change the variables around, you know what I'm saying, but it's always the same argument. And sometimes it's like, you know, he thinks he's smarter than me and, 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 and then it's just a variation of that. So you see Abram here, uh, he, he, he strives to win the peace here, to stop the fighting. He also allows Lot to take what he felt he needed first and trusted God to provide for himself. Again, in a debate, a lot of times, the self-talk is, well, if I let them you know, get away with this, you know, they're going to think I'm soft. They're going to think they can walk over me every time, blah, 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 right? So what he offers Lot is a deal that Lot just can't refuse. The problem was having enough land to support their livestock and Lot was given the choice of how much land and where he wanted it. And even notice the way that Abram speaks to his nephew. You ever hear some, you ever break up, you know, you, if you have children, you know, you're a teacher you're, or your own kids and they've had a fight and they've said nasty things to each other or, or worse still have struck each other and this and that and you've explained to them what's right, what's wrong, blah, blah, blah and they say, okay, now John, you know, I want you to apologize to uh, Mary, you know, and the apology goes something like this, sorry, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The words come out but the feeling's not there. So when you're looking at Abram and the way he's dealing here, you don't, you don't get the sense of that, do you? He said, look, we're brothers, you know. If, if, you want, if you want this, I'll go over here. And if you want that, well, I'll go over here. I'm ready to accommodate you. So uh, 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 he gives Lot the choice. Now let's look at Lot, okay, and Lot's decision. The Bible says that the land Lot chose was to his eyes like the Garden of Eden. Because when he speaks of the garden, it means the Garden of Eden. And think now, his ancestors may have even spoken of the Garden of Eden, right? That oral history going down from generation to generation. And then he says, or like the lush area of Egypt, which they had just left. The land also had established cities as well. So he chose all of the land and separated from Abram. Once again, it seemed on the surface that Lot chose well and served himself advantageously. However, if you look a little closer, this is what you see in Lot's decision. First of all, disrespect. He displayed disrespect since Abram was his elder and should have had first choice. In other words, when Abram said, you know, if you go left, I'll go right, and eh, right, left, you know, the proper response for Lot would be, thank you, my uncle, you're very gracious, but please, you go first. You go first. But he didn't do that. Secondly, he displayed selfishness. 
in that he made no offer to share any of the fertile land with Abraham. He wanted it all. <laughs> he also displayed a lack of spiritual wisdom because he was purposefully interjecting himself into an area that would be a temptation to him and his family. You know, the Bible specifies that the cities there were wicked. At first, it says, you know, he pitched his tent near the cities, but we know that eventually he was living in the cities. And I see that a lot of times you know, uh, with the members, things, other brothers and sisters, the decisions they make so unspiritual. Hey, I got a new job, you know, really? Yeah, 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 well, I'll be making 15% you know, more than I'm making now, and yet where are you going? Well, it's just a little town in you know, South Dakota, somewhere like that, but they're making a ton of money there, we're just going to move there. Is there a church there? Well, no, there's no church there. Oh, really? Yeah, so you're going to move, you and your kids are going to go to this place now, and you're going to make a lot of money, but there's no, no brethren there, nothing? Well, you know, <laughs> short-sighted decisions. Putting yourself you know, in the middle of something that challenges your faith. He also displayed foolishness in wanting to go it alone and not seeing the security that existed in remaining unified with his only relative and the only believer in that land, separating himself. And all of this is done for what reason? To promote his wealth, to promote his well-being. And so we go back and we see what happens with Abram. God renews his promise to Abram. We pick it up in um, verse, uh, uh, chapter 13, verse 14. It says, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. So once the separation is complete, it seems that Lot has gained the best in the deal. Fertile land, plenty of water, a developed city system, network, I mean, it's all good, right? Abram, what does he get? Well, he gets the desert, <laughs> he gets the mountains, he gets the sea, but he continues to have the presence and the promise of the Lord. Notice the Lord didn't appear to Lot. Notice that Lot didn't go and build an altar. He just you know, went about to make some money. Um, God then reviews and expands the promise to Abram. First of all, he says, he renews the land promise. All the land he sees, even that which he has given up, will be his and to his descendants. Of course, the Jews did not continually possess the land throughout history, and the Bible says that at the end of the world, the heavens and the earth will you know, be dissolved. But for a time, they would have the, the land. The promise, as we now understand it, is that the promised land actually re represents the kingdom of heaven and the spiritual descendants of Abraham will possess the kingdom forever. Well, we're, we're the descendants of Abraham, and we don't live in a, you know, um, a geographical location, we, we live in the kingdom of God. And yes, the people who are in the kingdom will be you know, without number. Can we count how many people are in the kingdom? No. We can count how many people go to church here, for example, but you know, we can't count how many of God's people are even in Choctaw, right? Let alone, let alone the world, and then let alone throughout, throughout history. So he renews the land promise, and that's very important because it seems at this point that Abraham's kind of given away the best part of the land. 
You know, he's got the scraps left, the mountains, you know, the desert, the sea, what can you do? He's not a sailor. He also renews the nation promise. Not only will he be the head of a great nation, that nation will be a blessing to others. That nation will produce a savior. That nation will be great in number, too great to count. In relation to the other nations, the Israelites were actually rather a small nation and they remain so today. The promise as we now understand it uh, in, in the light of the gospel refers to the spiritual descendants of Abram, those who are spiritual Israelites through Christ. These are a great number and continue to increase until Jesus, we don't know when Jesus is going to come. I know there are a lot of people out there trying to peg it to a year, you know, 2016. We don't know. He could come in a thousand years from now. Ten, he could come in 10,000. Could you imagine what the, we can't even imagine what the world would be like in a hundred years. Could you imagine if the world continues 10,000 more years? How many Christians there'll be? We don't know. Once again, Abram is encouraged by the Lord's renewed promise and he resettles himself after the separation with Lot. And what does he do? He builds another altar. He renews his fellowship with God, with the Lord. All right, so let's take a look at Abram's history. These chapters describe a world that has been confirmed by modern archeology. span all the names, the Ur and Mamre and all these places they talk about. Ur, interestingly enough, was only known through the Bible until it was discovered in the 19th century during an archeological dig. So for 18 centuries, well, even before then, but certainly in New Testament times, for 18 centuries, Christians you know, would teach Genesis and would teach the Old Testament and would talk about Abraham coming from the city of Ur. But there was no historical or archeological proof that that city ever existed. And so much of Christian apologetics, you know, like Kim, when Kim Wall and Marty, you know, when they do classes on apologetics, you know, the defense of the Bible, defense of the truth, and so on and so forth, the existence of God, part of the defense they used to make was the idea of error because the argument from non-believers was, look, the Bible's in error. You say it's inerrant? I've found, a, I've found a mistake. It claims that there's a city called Ur. There's no such city. No archeologists have ever found a city like that. It doesn't exist. So if you've got a mistake in the Bible, one mistake, that's the end of it. If you can have one mistake, you can have five or you can have 500. But by the 19th century, they had finally found Ur. Same thing as Haran, you know, mentions Haran, they mentioned, you know, they went to Haran, uh, Abram's father, and so on and so forth. Same thing, these, these sites were dug up in later years. Scientists found a civilization that was highly cultured with libraries, they had great cities, commerce, sophisticated architecture. Abram was in Egypt when that country was a great power and many of the pyramids were already centuries old. Can you imagine? So the life and the times of Abram are accurately depicted in the Bible. What you read in Genesis is a historical picture of that time which has been verified through modern archeology. span so not only is the history accurate, but so are the lessons that it teaches us about our lives today. And I want to wrap today's lesson up with some of those lessons that we draw. You know, a man called Richard Rogers, he was a teacher, he was a professor, a Bible professor at the Sunset Preaching School. He's passed away now many, many years. But I remember he used to, to demonstrate the depth of the Bible used to take Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Just that sentence. And he could develop 10 lessons just from that one verse. Just from that one verse. And, and his argument was, if I can develop 10 separate 
very in-depth lessons based on that one single verse. How deep do you think this whole book is? <laughs> we can never get to the bottom of it. That's why in churches, you know, this church has been here, what, 75 years? We're going to celebrate our 75th anniversary. How many times has the book of James been taught, or Matthew, or you know, the prophets, over and over? Generation after generation of Bible teachers and preachers continue teaching out of the same book, and yet the, the lessons are different. The points are different many times. So here's some lessons we get just from the simple explanation of Abram going to Egypt and then coming back. It's like a road trip. He went to Egypt, something happened, he came back, him and his nephews split up without having a fight, and then he moved on and built a new altar. I mean, pretty straightforward stuff, right? But there's some important lessons here. For example, one lesson is that God will take you back. We're always preaching God wants you to, but He'll take you back. Abram had received God's promises and had immediately discarded them. And this is after God appeared to him. Imagine. How much, you know, how much proof do you need? Notice that when he returned to Canaan and renewed his prayer, God restored Abram and blessed him by renewing his promises again. Just in case Abram was not sure that God had taken him back, God kind of says, okay, let's, let's review now what I said I was going to do for you. you know, we sometimes feel that what we've done many times is so bad or so repetitive and I think, that's, that's, I think I need to stop there, because I don't think there are any ax murderers you know, in our congregation. Maybe there are, I'm not sure, you know, but I don't think there are some big time criminals you know, in, our, in our congregation. But there are repeat offenders. There are repeat offenders. And a lot of times it's the repetition of our sins that discourages us so much. You know, Ron and I, we play golf together, and one of the things I say as we're playing, you know, he's a good player and I'm, you know, just, I'm learning, and I keep saying to him, I'm making the same mistake over and over again. I, mean, I know what to do, I know exactly what I have to do, and I lifted my head or I did this or whatever. You know, I'm making the same stupid mistake over and over and over again. You know? That's okay at golf. At golf, you know, you're having fun, you're getting some fresh air, you know, it's a game. But in life, in life, when we keep making the same mistake over and over again, it just wears you down spiritually because you're fed up with yourself. It's one thing being fed up with somebody else, but when you're fed up with yourself, then that's a soul killer. And the great lesson I get from this is God takes you back because He's not like us. <laughs> he doesn't have the you know, he has more depth to his love. He has more bottom to his patience than we do. So when we're fed up with us, let's remember Abram and the fact that God takes him back. This story shows us that God is not only ready to take us back, but He's happy to take us back. Note how He blessed Abram even more when Abram did the right thing with Lot. And you know the story, I'm not, this is no spoiler alert here. Is he going to do this thing again? Well, yeah, he's going to make this mistake. Same mistake, he's going to make it again further down the line. So God will take us back. A lot of times the problem is we won't go back. We won't go back. But we should never think that God will not take us back. Never. Second lesson, sin always has side effects, always. They came out of Egypt rich in material goods, but the loss of respect because of his actions divided him and Lot. I'm convinced that it played a part in that, in that problem there. Because Lot treated his uncle with disrespect. And you wonder why. Where did he lose that respect? They came out of Egypt rich in material goods, but because they gained much of it through deception, it caused strife and self-centeredness and competition between the two families. The most dangerous lie that Satan promotes 
is that just one sin or one little sin will not matter in the long run. How many people have ruined their lives because someone said, go ahead, try it. What can it hurt? Or they said, why not? The best reason to take kids to VBS and to bring them to, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, but you know, let's get it on record, let's get it on tape. The best reason to bring these children to Sunday school or Bible camp or whatever, you know, the best reason is that they are going to learn the answer to the question, why not? When they're with their friends and their friends say, let's do this or let's try that and this is cool and whatever, you know what I'm saying? And it's not too clear and, 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 they, and the question that comes back to these young people is, why not? Well, the answer should, sh they should answer that question from within, from God's word. Why not? Because this is a sin, because this is wrong, because lying is a sin, because uh, sexual impurity is against God's way, and so on and so forth. You know? There has to be an answer to the why not. The wage of sin is death, of course, Romans 6, 23. And we receive the effect of every sin we make sooner or later. There's never a pass for any sin that we ever make. That's another, <laughs> no matter how small the sin is, you know, there's always consequences further on down the line. Third lesson, God's word is sure. For thousands of years, skeptics could say that the only proof of Ur's existence was the Bible, and that was not really proof at all. For thousands of years, believers had to base their faith only on what the Word said about this thing and that the Word promised that if it said so, it was true. So before the 19th century, you had to say, I believe that Ur is an actual place because the Bible says so, even if there is no physical evidence for its existence. And people would say, well, man, you are like, you know, what are you? you know, you're a child. You're a child. You're foolish. You're basing a belief on zero just because this book says so. Again, in the 19th century, scientists proved that this word of God was accurate. The skeptics were wrong and believers were justified in their faith. Now, I think that God helps our faith along with these types of discoveries you know, from time to time, and I'm glad for it. It's great. However, there are a lot of things in the Bible that remain strictly matters of faith. The Word says so, and I believe it because the Word said so. I mean, you know, the Word tells us that the world will end. It will be dissolved. The, world, the Word excuse me, says that we will resurrect from the dead in glorified bodies. Can you prove that? Have you ever seen a glorified body? No. The only thing I'm going on is the word said so. Uh, the word says that Satan will be destroyed at the end, will be cast forever in the dark pit. You know. The word says that Satan exists. Have you ever seen Satan? I've seen movies about Satan. You know what I'm saying? So there's still a lot of material in the Bible that we have to accept only based on the based on the word, that, that there, there'll never be any, quote, physical proof for, uh, for it. You know? How does the Holy Spirit live in you? Well, pff, I don't know how, I just know that He does, through faith. So let's remember, uh, it's our turn in our generation not to wait for science to prove our faith for us, but rather say, the Bible says this, and I believe it. Uh, you know those uh, apologetics classes where they they, they, they give you all the scientific proof to also prove you know, things that the Bible says. I think that's great, I think that's good. It's uh, affirming, but that's not what I'm going on. I'm not, I'm not basing my eternal spiritual life on what some microbiologist says or some physicist says, that he happens to, she, he happens to agree with the word of God. That's not what my faith is built. 
My faith is based on the fact that the grave was empty. The word says the grave was empty. That's where my faith is. I mean, uh, I wasn't there at the beginning of the world. The Hebrew writer says, we, how, how do we believe? We believe that God created the things that are from things that are not seen. So you can have a hundred classes you know, on creationism and so on and show all the physical proofs and that's great, that's you know, faith building, that's terrific. But that's not the reason I believe. The reason I believe is because the writer of Hebrews says that God created the things that, we, that are from things that are not seen. I don't understand that physically, empirically, I accepted by faith because the writer says, by faith we know this, by faith we know Ur existed, by faith we know Paul existed, by faith we know that the tomb was empty. Because brothers and sisters, we walk by faith, not by sight. But let's never you know, forget what kind of people that we are. So some proof may come along to help us out from time to time, but the Lord is looking for those people like Abram who did not see, but he believed anyways. These are the true descendants of Abram that the Bible says will inherit the promises made to him. And I repeat the same lesson over and over again. It's always about faith. Everything we do, everything that's happening to us, it's always about you know, God is taking us and holding us up to examine us to see how our faith is doing. Okay. All right, that's where we're at with this particular thing. That's it for this time.